Okay, deep thought. Uh, hello to everyone. I'm Daniel Soral Blanco. I am a PhD student at the University of Geneva, and it's a pleasure for me to, to make this video presenting uh, my work together with my supervisor, Lucas Lombriser, for my master thesis, where we have worked out a self tuning mechanism for the cosmological constant where we uh, aim to, to solve the cosmological constant problems that haunt uh, theoretical physics for, for, for many time. And this, uh, this little history starts with, uh, with the content of the universe, where, because we know that the majority of the, of the energy in the universe is in the form of something that we call dark energy, that we don't really know uh, what it is. But we can know from uh, the cross measurements of several different uh, observations like supernova explosions, CMB and baryonic acoustic oscillations that dark energy is a perfect fluid which will have this equ an equation of a state within this range of values, which uh, is perfectly consistent with, uh, with adding a cosmological constant to the, to the Einstein field equations so that we are not going to, to complicate this picture anymore by adding any dark energy model. And we are going to stay faithful to the, to the, to the, simple, to the, more, to the simpler model that is to add a constant to, this, uh, to the theory of gravity. So the self-tuning mechanism starts with, the, with taking the action for gravity and matter in the semi-classical regime, where we treat the, the fields as the, the matter fields uh, quantum mechanically using uh, quantum field theory, the standard quantum field theory. And we stay uh, in, the classical, in the classical level uh, in, in the theory of gravity using the, the Einstein-Hilbert action, the standard Einstein-Hilbert action. Uh, what we usually do is to vary the, the, this action with respect to the metric and obtaining the Einstein field equations, what here appears the so-called cosmological constant. This is the Einstein, Einstein tensor. And this is the stress energy tensor, which came from, from this part here. This accounts for all the matter content in the universe. And the ingredient that we propose to, to add to this, uh, to this picture is to perform an additional variation of this action with respect to the Planck mass, to the, uh, to the square Planck mass. What we achieve with this is to obtain an extra constraint, an extra dynamical constraint that uh, will be useful, as I will show later, in order to cancel out the vacuum energy contributions that came from this part that always spoil uh, the observations uh, that we make about the cosmological constant. Because all the vacuum energy contributions that appear from here will contribute to this term. And uh, what we can think of this is to interpret, uh, we are implicitly interpreting the Planck mass, the square Planck mass as a global Lagrange multiplier that give us this uh, additional constraint on the dynamics of gravity, which we can uh, rewrite into this form where we have defined this bracket as the space time average of the quantity inside, in this case, the rich scalar. So using this, uh, we start uh, developing our mechanism, which consists in first, be, before performing the, the, the variations, we separate the Lagrangian density in this, uh, into this, uh, in this form, where here uh, there is the, the matter fields without the, all the vacuum energy contributions that we separate out in the, into this term. And we add here a global contribution, uh, a global term there uh, of this, uh, the Planck mass to the square. Uh, in order to, to be consistent, what we have to do is to add a classical counter term, uh, following a bit the spirit of what is usually done in quantum field theory. And after doing this, the equations of motion, the Einstein field equations will take this form. Well, all the contributions different, all the constant contribution will appear uh, to, here in this term, uh, contributing to the cosmological constant. And then the additional constraint that we obtain uh, after uh, varying the action with respect to the Planck mass to the square is uh, will take this form where we can see that basically uh, all the different contributions will be constrained to be this quantity here where tau represents the, the, the trace of the stress energy tensor uh, for the matter fields 
where after we have removed the vacuum energy contributions. What we have to do is solve this constraint for the counter term and use the result into the Einstein field equations so that we obtain the effective field equations for our model, which will take this form, which we, where we immediately see that vacuum energy has canceled so that um, the conclusion is that uh, vacuum energy is not a gravitating quantity for our theory. So, and that the cosmological constant will be determined by this uh, contribution here. And this, uh, this, will, uh, this, um, this should be what, uh, what we measure. What uh, we have done for, for my master thesis uh, was to, once we have the, the global model, we want really to understand how we can construct a local formalism from where the variations with respect to the Planck mass emerge naturally. And for that, uh, we have a um, clear candidate the most simple candidate, the, the most simple candidate that we can that we can think of, is basically a scalar tensor theory of gravity in the Jordan frame, where basically what we have is uh, that the the gravitational coupling is is a, a field, uh, a field uh, psi, uh, uh, phi, and that the um, we have an additional te uh, term here, which is a potential, which also depends on the field. And this is what will play the role of the cosmological constant. Uh, this uh, action here will have a more complicated dynamics than the original uh, Einstein-Hilbert action, but uh, we can simplify the thing and achieve for a constant uh, uh, for a constant gravitational coupling by adding an extra ingredient to this theory. What we have to add to this uh, to this theory. To this action here is an extra ingredient which takes this form here which is uh, which includes a, a non-linear arbitrary function of the scalar field and mm, an auxiliary uh, field strength which uh, takes this definition here where a uh, is a three form gauge field but this will not have any dynamics at all this is just an additional field that we will introduce in order to render this uh, the dynamics of this field constant in the domain of the action which is the next thing i'm going to explain to you so for the theory that we have above uh, we perform the usual operations we vary it with respect to the metric obtaining the einstein field equations for this theory with this additional ingredient which is the one that complicates the dynamics of the of the model we also perform um, a variation with respect to the three-form gauge field, where, uh, as I said before, it fixes the dynamics of, of psi, of phi, because uh, what we obtain is this expression here, uh, equating to zero, where we can immediately see that the derivative of the field, the first derivative of the field is zero, and it will be zero always in all the domain of the, in the entire domain of the action. Uh, in addition to that, we have also to perform a variation with respect to, to phi and obtaining the what usually should be the field equation for phi. But since the dynamics of this field are fixed here, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, essentially a constraint, an additional constraint analogous to the one that I showed you in the, in the global model. But in this case, take this form where the primes denotes derivative with respect to, psi, to phi. And we have this additional sector here which comes from the from the extra from the from the three from from the three form sector so um, we play the same game as before we separate out the lagrangian and add a counter term uh, bc uh, and we introduce this notation here which will be the difference that uh, remains uh, between the potential and the counter term but the the thing that we have to take into account here is that we allow for the contributions or the different contributions to the cosmological constant to be arbitrarily arbitrarily dependent on phi. Uh, we can do this and define a set of parameters which will um, basically measure, in a sense, the dependence of these uh, parameters in in the field. Which, once we can, once we have fixed the 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 dynamics of the field uh, we, using the the constraint I showed you before. We can immediately we can always set it to be uh, the Planck mass to the square. Uh, take into account here that we are defining alpha as the same parameter for the uh, vacuum energy and the and the counter term, 
this is because we are implicitly assuming that the counter term must have the same dependence on alpha than the vacuum energy contributions in order to cancel them. But the leftover that we have after introducing this it can be or can be in general a different. So we take into account that this beta can be is, is, is different generally than this one. So that the constraint on the on the the constraint from the variation with respect to the Planck mass will take this form here, where we have this which now depends on these parameters, and has this additional term here coming from the three form sector. An interesting point here is that even if we have assumed that the functions are arbitrarily dependent on phi, once we fix it, when we fix the the value of the scalar, this constraint will always be fixed. So we have a constraint for each value that we for each value that we choose for the for the scalar field. So now we we solve for the counter term and we plug it into the Einstein field equations, obtaining these effective field equations here, which now have these two additional terms. This one, this uh, lambda lambda. This delta lambda is defining in this form, which also has a, a bracket in a sense that defi the bracket defining like this, like the integra integrating the three form and dividing by the by the volume of the manifold. And we can immediately see that this is if we take beta and alpha to be equal to one, this is uh, this is similar. This is very close to the simple simplest global safety union scenario for alpha for for the simplest global set tuning scenario that I showed you before, for these values of the of the parameters, with the difference that we have here, uh, if you remember the, the the question before, we only have this term, and here because we are adding a a, a boundary contribution, we have this uh, this term this term here. Just to notice here that um, for different values of alpha and beta, we will all uh, will correspond to other possible models, and we've have found that uh, for alpha and beta equal to zero, what we have is the result uh, from the sequestering mechanism, which is a, a mechanism uh, which has been proposed uh, around the 2014 and 2015 by by these people here in a, in a wonderful set of papers that are very interesting. That's, and it is basically the, the first model where we, where they achieve for the cancel for the a dynamical cancellation of vacuum energy contributions at the level of the of the Einstein equation. So uh, what we uh, can uh, mention about the the delta lambda contributions is that they will always appear in every local model that includes this kind of uh, three form field strength. And this uh, this delta lambda. Will always uh, will always be uh, some uh, ratio of fluxes of the different four form sectors. In our case, since we only have one form sector, the, this ratio is given by the flux of this three form uh, across the boundary and the the four volume of the manifold, which is very interesting uh, and quite simple, because. Um, even if we uh, we can we have to remain ag agnostic about the nature of these th uh, three form fields, but uh, assuming that they are uh, ultraviolet stable quantities and that they are small, which uh, uh, can be some reasonable assumptions, and that given the fact that they are controlled by the four volume in the denominator, uh, we can always naturally expect that they go to zero if the if the universe grow large enough. And they will uh, be exactly zero if the if the if the universe is eventually infinite. So we can forget uh, about this uh, additional contribution, and we can just try to calculate the the residual cosmological constant by using only this uh, this space space time average of the trace of the stress energy tensor. I will show you later how to perform such a calculation, and that this gives us a very interesting result. Uh, beyond that, we have also a second paper, uh, which is now under the re revision, that uh, where we have analyzed further aspects of our model. Now uh, we can see that uh, we have seen that the self tuning mechanism is as easily generalized to the more general framework of Kornteski theory. We just have to take Horodesky action and add this additional sector that fixes the dynamics of the scalar field. 
So immediately all the derivative terms will vanish and we only have to choose uh, two functions of the two Horndesky functions in order to recover our mechanism. Then uh, we have to take into account also that if we want to go beyond the semi-classical limit, graviton loops will spoil the mechanism. So graviton loops will appear, uh, will have some contributions to the gravitational coupling that will not be cancelled then after varying where they are, they depend in the Planck mass to the square and they will not disappear after, uh, through this constraint that we obtain uh, after the variation with respect to the Planck mass. Uh, but this thing has been analyzed before by the same people of the sequestering and other that have been uh, analyzing these kind of models. And uh, it, is, it is solved by the addition of a gauss bonnet invariant uh, in a special way. We have to take the gauss bonnet invariant and uh, couple it to another parameter and add an, a second additional sector. And this solves this issue of the graviton loops. This cancel the graviton loops because it picks up the correct uh, terms that cancel the graviton loops, uh, up, at least up to the next to leading order in perturbation theory. And the last thing that we have analyzed, and this is the thing where which uh, I'm going to focus on on the on the next slides, is that we can possibly co com combine inflation and self tuning uh, self tuning into the same framework, and this gives us a very interesting. Uh, very interesting picture about of our universe. Uh, to do this, what we have to do to combine uh, inflation and self-tuning, uh, we can modify our action, our original action, by adding this term to the additional sector, which this uh, this is a theta function, which means that uh, this term is here when this uh, the phi minus the Planck to the square is greater than zero. But when the phi minus plan to the square is lower than zero, this will be this will vanish. This term will vanish, and we are always remaining. We all we only remain with this part, which can be uh, which can be considered as a standard uh, inflationary model, uh, where the inflation is now dri dri driven by this uh, this scalar field here. Schematically, we can see what happens uh, in a in a in a situation like this: is that we can uh, split up this integral between two regions, one where the self-tuning is operating, we call U, and the other, the complementary region where the, where the, where, where, where the, where the field is still uh, driving inflation. So this is the idea that we propose. We split the manifold M into two, two distinct regions. And what we have to do, here is to solve the interfield equations for H, which is the metric on N on the inflating region, and for G, which is the metric for U in the in the in the self tuning region. They will be uh, in general they will be different, and we have to solve the dynamics uh, independently. Uh, we have to we assume that matter content is the same of both patches, both patches, which uh, immediately tell us that the vacuum energy contributions are exactly the same on on the on both. And uh, we can think of this splitting as uh, time-like, such that we have some uh, initial epoch where uh, we have inflation. That uh, then, after the universe evolves, we start uh, eventually uh, inflation ends, and we have. Um, and we have a self-tuning from, from that point. Or the other is the, the space-like separation, where we have, which is the one that corresponds to the diagram that I showed you before, which basically uh, we have uh, distinct regions, separated independent regions. Uh, and this can be uh, compatible with a picture for the, for the multiverse. This is the last one which have more interest because the, the first one can, can have more uh, phenomenological implications that we have not looked uh, at yet uh, in, in, in deep. So uh, we can calculate the equations of motion for the dynamical region by varying with respect to the metric and the field. So that we obtain this uh, set of equations here, which are dynamic, which are, uh, which are a set of a couple equations, couple uh, differential equations. And there is a problem here because we, here we don't have this constraint of the dynamics of the field and the field is completely dynamical on that region. And we have an important theorem uh, given by Weinberg in the, in the 80s when he started analyzing this co the cosmological constant problem that basically tell us that there is the no self-tuning solution with massive particle exists for this set of equations. 
we can obtain uh, solving these equations we can obtain a a, a, a universe with uh, massless particles and self-tuning but not with massive particles and self-tuning at the same time and then uh, we can rewrite the second equation as a as a, a into this form which now is not a constant on its own right it's just is is a it's a local dynamical equation where that we need to solve first and then plug the dynamics here to solve the thing about the cosmological constant or with or vice versa we have to solve first the cosmological constant uh, issue and then uh, which always which is constraining the dynamics of the field so uh, what can do here well since we are working with space-time averages we are going to to use this tool here also and the interesting thing is that taking the space-time average of this equation here transform this local equation into a global relation we are relating the the, the global space-time averages of these different contributions here and we can isolate them in order to obtain a residual in this uh, dynamical in this uh, in this region I'm not giving you the equation for this uh, residual, but uh, I, I tell you that it's dynamically determined by the average of the field, the average of the derivatives of the field, and the field itself in this region. So it's a complicated expression that we need to solve. But uh, the consistency with physics in the other region, because since physics must be consistent in between the two regions, suggest us the adoption of the some boundary conditions that even if we are completely agnostic on what happened on the region n at least in the boundary we should uh, recover the constraint on the field where the, the first derivative is zero and then uh, the both uh, residuals must uh, must uh, must be the same at the boundary so when take the 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 limit uh, when the f when the field goes to the Planck mass to the square <coughs> what we obtain is a constraint on the average of the field on the region n which depend which takes this form here which depends on the matter content on both on both regions depends on the uh, boundary contribution in the region u and depends also on the derivative of the on the dynamics of the field inside the region n but we can get rid of this term here by assuming by simply assuming a slow, a slow roll conditions in the in the inflating region which is a standard assumption for inflationary for inflationary models be, uh, where we send uh, we consider immediately that uh, that uh, basically the derivative the second derivative of the field is negligible the acceleration of the field is negligible so that the average on over the region can be also considered to be negligible uh, this uh, this picture of the different distinct and separate space-like regions uh, lead us to a kind of multiverse interpretation where we can distinguish two types at least two types of multiverses the type one where the dynamics of the scalar field on the region is different but the fundamental constants are fixed and the type two where the fundamental constants such as the Planck mass may also vary across different regions for the case of a type one multiverse in the safe in the case of the self-tuning of the self-tuning scenario what we must have is that the the scalar field on n will also be because the scalar field is what uh, the one that will determine the, the gravitational coupling this gravitational coupling will 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 be the same because it will be a fundamental constant such as the Planck mass and it will take always this value also in n so we can assume that n is also a frozen region n is also a region where the we can have also n as a region where there is self-tuning operating and this uh, the, le the, the last constraint will reduce to a constraint on the flux of the three form which take this form this means that the, con the flux of the three form this delta lambda will always be the difference between of these um, between the averages of this uh, of this of the matter content in in the different regions so that will be in will be controlled by the by the relative volume of the of these regions and then we can having expressed all the having shown the how the mechanism work and how we can combine it with, with inflation let's move to the predictions that we have done and we the first one is the we, ca we have calculated the value for for lambda and uh, we have uh, proposed an anthropic argument that supports the multiverse uh, interpretation 
So the, for the residual cosmological constant, uh, after the after we de gravitate vacuum energy contributions, we are left to evaluate this contribution here, this quantity here, which is we take this form, where tau is basically the the matter density inside the the, the patch we are inside the the region we are working on. Uh, the problem is that for the standard lambda CDM model with perfect homogeneity, uh, this uh, quantity is zero. So that uh, this is why uh, we usually mm, could claim that we could need some extra dark energy ingredient in order to account for the for the gravitational constant, for the expansion of the universe. But we propose to do an alternative thing here. Instead of adding an extra dark energy ingredient, we are going to uh, rethink our picture about the universe on the small and intermediate scales, because we are relaxing, basically we relax the homogeneity assumption on small intermediate scales. We consider that it's not entirely homogeneous. The universe is not entirely homogeneous on that scales. And we move to, to, to the halo model picture, what we have told, called the halo model picture, what was first, firstly proposed by Lucas in a paper of his in 2018. And basically what we have here in this picture is that at some niche time, we have all this, this uh, the thing inside the, the black circle is the observable universe and all the matter content in the universe is distributed in, in different patches, in different uh, separated patches. M will be the observable universe for us, the manifold where we are working on, and then U will be the halo where we live in. And these halos will always develop into maximally gravitationally bound structures where galaxies can form eventually planets and then after that uh, life and and computers to be to be today as here talking about this topic the point is that um, the, the evolution of the universe is uh, an expansion and a competition between expansion and the self-gravitation inside the patches so those patches grow and separate between themselves. Up to the, at late times, at very late times, what we have is that uh, the manifold M, the, universe, the observable universe, will reduce to the to the halo U. And everything that goes outside the halo U, everything that goes out the the maximally gravitationally bound structure around us, uh, will be uh, or expel out uh, the expel out the event horizon such that uh, it is uh, it is not observable anymore or uh, redshift the way such that it cannot be effectively observable anymore and we have a model to study these things which is the spherical collapse of symmetric top hat over densities using this model and assuming that at late times uh, being uh, zeta the radius of the observable universe and r uh, and r max the radius of the the maximum radius of the of the of the top hat over density uh, the radius of the universe will reduce to the maximum radius of this region when uh, we take enough large times or we can even take uh, time infinite in an infinite universe the point, the interesting point, also analyzed, analyzed by Lucas before, is that uh, space-time integrals like that, like the like the space-time average of uh, of tau, are completely dominated by the future state of the manifold. So, assuming uh, assuming that this sorry, assuming that this happens, uh, we can uh, find that tau reduced to the maximum density that uh, appears in the in the in the matter patch we are we are living in which can be rewritten to this form because this maximum radius is related uh, by the observed cosmological constant through the equations of the spherical collapse model so we can isolate the observed cosmological constant to be this quantity which uh, translates that the residual cosmological constant being this means that the residual cosmological constant reduced to be must reduce to be the observed cosmological constant uh, we have to notice here that we are not predicting actually the value of the cosmological constant, but what we are predicting is that the residual cosmological constant is uh, self-consistent with the observed cosmological constant that we must have at late times. So that uh, we can say that the late times of the late expansion is dynamically generated by structural formation in that way, by as after assuming the, this picture where 
uh, the different regions evolve independently and eventually grow, grow at some point up to some uh, maximum radius. And this is, of course, an ideal case because this is a very instable picture because uh, if, if the density is slightly smaller than, than, than the maximum density, this will grow forever. And if it is a slightly bigger than this maximum density, the, the structure will recollapse in the future in, to, the, to, a, to, a, to a single point. But um, after calculating the, the cosmological constant, and find and finding that it is exact it is it must reduce to the observed cosmological constant at late times we can move and try to answer the the other cosmological constant problem which is the the why now question the coincidence problem why the the observed uh, matter the observed uh, dark energy density is just uh, of the same order of magnitude of the of the mass density of the dark matter density and uh, by only a different factor. And what we have to do is using the, the equations of the spherical collapse model, we have we can define some parameters here, which this is a dimensionless parameter where we have the radius of the observable universe and the top hat radius, where this is the density inside the patch, and then this depends on time. And what we can do is some kind uh, to adopt some kind of uh, statistical analysis. We can adopt a uniform prior on this parameter here. And we take that today we are uh, on this parameter today is one half, which means that there is as much evolution behind us that the evolution that uh, is still to happen in the future for our uh, maximally bound structure. Uh, what we have to do is using this, this, uh, this uniform prior here, we can solve for T0 independently, completely independently of, the cosmo of other cosmological parameters for these ultimate collapse structures. And what we find is that uh, the, the cosmological dark energy parameter, it will take this value here, which is in very good agreement with the, for today, we'll take this value, which is in very good agreement with the, with the actual observations coming from, from Planck satellite, for instance. So this is, is very encouraging for us and lead us to, to to think that we have really uh, given an explanation, a good explanation on first the, the vacuum energy problem, why uh, the large uh, vacuum energy contributions do not spoil our mes measurements, and why the, there exists this coincidence today. It seems that this coincidence means that the acceleration of the universe has just uh, started very recently on our cosmic history. And we didn't have any good reason for this, but this can give us a, a hint on why this is happening. And now uh, let me recover the multiverse picture and let me talk about the life, universe and, and everything a little bit in a couple of slides, <laughs> maybe, maybe a bit ambitious, but uh, what we propose is to incorporate a kind of anthropic argument to the multiverse picture I have explained before. For, to the, for doing this, we first compute the state formation history. Then we compute the evolution of cosmic metallicity. We have this. Uh, we can do this by by using some results that have been done before by some uh, by other astrophysical uh, analysis. And the the important point from this is that from from the star formation history and the evolution of cosmic metallicity, we can first uh, infer the formation probability of terrestrial planets, and by assuming our our own experience on Earth, we can always we can also infer the emergence probability for intelligent life. We know that uh, since the Earth was formed, it has uh, it has been some time after uh, after intelligent life uh, emerges first. And we can always we can we propose also to introduce a number n, which is the order of magnitude difference between the diameter of the universe, the U and the charge radius of the proton. And we introduce this in order to uh, we introduce this as a sensible parameter in order to compare the evolution between the different uh, matter patches that we can call uh, universes, if you want. So I showed you now the results uh, in the next slide. So we have in the left hand side, in the left uh, graph, we have the state formation history, which has a peak at some point in the in the past couple of, of of billion years 
after the Big Bang. Then, the, then it started the the the, ter, the formation of terrestrial planets started after the star formation peak after the, the solar systems start evolving and they start forming planets. And its peak at some point in the past about more or less uh, like nine billion years later. And based, as I said before, based on our experience of of, of on Earth. We can infer that the emergency of intelligent life can happen a couple of years later, like uh, 11, a bit more than 11 uh, year, 11 billion years before. And here I, we plot the the our the date, the age of the universe, and we can see that it's very close to the actual peak of the emergence probability of intelligent life. So we are in a in a in the in the correct. Uh, in the correct point of uh, of the evolution, let's say, it, it started a little before than 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 we than we a little before than today, let's say, because <laughs> if not, it will not make sense. And then, for comparing the the the, the thing on between universe, we use these orders of magnitudes, and using the the values for our universe. Uh, the the radius of of our universe today, sorry, the diameter of our universe today, and the the charge radius of the protons, and we have chosen protons because uh, protons are the basic building blocks for life. Protons form molecules. Uh, for molecules, you can form uh, the the actual you can form actual life. And we plot here that uh, the date of the uh, after the combination. And we plot here the emergence of life, the, the emergence probability of life, which we have found to be uh, very sharply peaked around this value today. This, uh, this is the date of today. And the peak it reaches exactly at 42, which maybe can be which is the thing that uh, surprises uh, us uh, more. And the question that remains is that, does the emergence of life always peak at 42 in the multiverse? Can really be 42 the answer of the question of life, the universe and everything? Okay, we left this open for, for discussion and I hope you like this presentation. But get, let me first um, give some conclusions here. So we have seen that the self-tuning mechanism produces the gravitation of vacuum energy contributions to the cosmological constant, the important thing, solving the old cosmological constant problem. We have estimated the residual by invoking a new picture on the, on the universe, a halo model picture, where we consider matter is separated in different patches. And we assume that the evolution of these matter patches, of these massive patches, is basically uh, de described by a spherical collapse of top hat, uh, top hat over densities that form ultimately maximally bound structures. And we live in a, one of these uh, maximally bound structures, which for our cases, for uh, there are some simulations that uh, tell us uh, that uh, our maximally bound structure is basically uh, the, 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 the set formed by the Milky Way, our galaxy, and Andromeda, our neighbor galaxy. Then uh, self-tuning and inflation can be unified in a single framework. And if we assume that the, the space-like separation between regions is space-like, this uh, naturally provides us with a multiverse picture. Then we introduce an anthropic argument that uses a state formation history, the evolution of cosmic metallicity, and the terrestrial planet formation, uh, make us making us possible to infer the emergence of probability of observers, uh, the emergence probability of life, the, the, emergence pro the probability that we are now, today talking about this. And interestingly enough, we have found that for our universe, the emergence probability of observers is strongly, strongly peaks when the order of magnitude between the diameter of the universe and the charge radius of the proton takes exactly the value 42. So thank you a lot for listening. I hope you liked the talk. And please, as Marvin is telling you, don't panic. Thank you. <laughs>